Hello and welcome to How Monks Played. In this video we'll look at the rules and mechanics that are pivotal to playing a monk in Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remastered. And just as a bit of expectation setting here at the start, I should mention what this video is not. This video does not contain build advice or an overview of all of the abilities that are gained when leveling up, as several of them like proficiency increases are not unique to monks. The feats and abilities discussed will focus on the lower levels since this video is intended for newer players, and note that this video is not a review of the perceived quality, effectiveness, or value of the class. But what this video will provide you with are all of the foundational mechanics that make playing a monk different from playing any other class. Let's start by looking at a few of the abilities and mechanics that are shared among all monks. First up is unarmed attacks. As martial artists, a monk's unarmed attacks are more deadly than normal. Unarmed attacks are made with a part of the body instead of a manufactured weapon. This could be your fist, heel, knee, elbow, or forehead, and they all count as unarmed strikes. In addition, unarmed strikes could include things like claws, biting, or swiping with a tail. Some ancestries even offer ranged unarmed attacks, such as the Leshy's ability to launch seed pods. In general, all unarmed attacks are treated as using a fist per the table on page 277 of Player Core 1, even if within the narrative you describe the attack as a kick or headbutt. They deal 1d4 bludgeoning damage, belong to the brawling group, and have the agile, finesse, non-lethal, and unarmed traits. Of note here is the non-lethal trait. By default, Unarmed attacks cannot kill a target unless the attacker wishes to make their attacks lethal, which imposes a negative two circumstance penalty to attack rolls. Special unarmed attacks, such as those provided by certain ancestries, modify these rules as listed in each entry. For example, Razor Tooth Goblins gain a bite attack. The attack bonus for this is calculated the same as any other unarmed attack, but it deals 1d6 piercing damage it only has the finesse and unarmed traits, meaning this bite attack lacks the agile and non-lethal traits that normal unarmed attacks have. And it's important to note that since this bite is still an unarmed attack, any bonuses or penalties that apply to unarmed attacks apply to biting the same as they would to punching. So those are the normal rules for unarmed attacks, but what makes monks special is their powerful fist ability. When monks make unarmed attacks, they do not suffer the negative 2 penalty for making lethal attacks, and the damage die for basic unarmed attacks increases from 1d4 to 1d6. As a monk levels up, their unarmed attacks become increasingly more powerful too. At 3rd level, monks gain the Mystic Strikes ability that allows their unarmed attacks to overcome resistances to non-magical attacks. At 5th level, the Expert Strikes ability grants critical specialization for unarmed attacks in the Brawling group, meaning when a monk makes an unarmed strike and scores a critical hit, the target must succeed at a Fortitude save or be slowed 1. At 7th level, monks gain a weapon specialization that increases the damage of their unarmed strikes, and this bonus is further increased at 15th level. At 9th level, Monks gain the Metal Strikes ability that treats their unarmed attacks as if they were made of cold iron or silver, meaning these attacks trigger weaknesses to those metals in certain creatures like demons, devils, and fey. And monks gain Adamantine Strikes that treats their unarmed attacks as if they were made of Adamantine, meaning they overcome resistances such as the Gargoyle's resistance to all physical damage except Adamantine. And it may be worth noting that normal adamantine weapons reduce the hardness of objects they strike by half as long as the object's hardness is not more than the weapon's hardness. But unarmed attacks do not have a hardness, so monks do not receive this bonus from the adamantine strike's ability. However, they can take the shattering strike feat at 16th level to gain this. So that's the general information you'll need to know about unarmed strikes. Next, let's look at the monk's trademark ability, Flurry of Blows. This allows monks to make two unarmed strikes at the cost of only one action. The multiple attack penalty applies to these strikes normally, 
meaning there is no penalty for the first strike, assuming the monk has not already made an attack this round, but the multiple attack penalty will apply for the second strike with Flurry of Blows. These strikes can target any enemies within range, so they can apply to two different creatures, but if the monk decides to use both strikes on the same enemy and they both hit, you combine the damages of both strikes together for the purposes of resistances and weaknesses. And also note that Flurry of Blows has the Flourish trait, meaning it can only be used once per turn. Let's take a look at a few examples. In our first example, Sage and the Monk is using Flurry of Blows to punch a goblin twice. This costs his first action of the turn, the first strike is made with no multiple attack penalty, and the second is made with a negative 4 multiple attack penalty. Negative 4 instead of negative 5, because fist attacks have the agile trait. If you wanted to continue making unarmed attacks with his second and third actions this turn, those attacks would be made with a negative 8 penalty. Now let's say this goblin Sajin is fighting is a monk 2 and has the razor tooth heritage. On its turn, the goblin uses flurry of blows, spends one action, and attacks Sajin twice. The first strike is an unarmed fist attack and the second is a bite attack. The first strike is made with no multiple attack penalty, but the second is made with a negative 5 penalty instead of negative 4 because their bite attack does not have the agile trait. So they would have been better off leading with their bite. In our third example, Sajin is fighting two Ugathals or Faceless Stalkers. He could decide to use Flurry of Blows to attack the same Ugathal twice, or each of them once. Let's say he decides to divide his attacks. He would make a strike against the first Ugathal with no penalty, and then strike the second Ugathal with a negative 4 multiple attack penalty. We'll say both are hits, so next he rolls his damage for each strike separately. He deals 6 points of damage to the first one, and 8 points of damage to the second. But, since Ugathals have resistance 5 to bludgeoning damage, this resistance is applied to both strikes separately, meaning Sajin deals only 1 point of damage to the first enemy, and 3 points of damage to the second. But, if he had decided to only attack one of them, and succeeded on both strikes, then the damage would have been combined for the purposes of overcoming resistances. In that case, you would add the 6 damage from the first strike to the 8 damage of the second strike for a total of 14, and then subtract the 5 resistance to bludgeoning only once, and that target would suffer a total of 9 points of damage instead of only 3. And next, let's take that same example, but instead of Ugathals that are resistant to bludgeoning damage, Sajin is fighting a pair of Necrophidiuses who are weak to bludgeoning damage. If he chooses to attack one of them with both of his strikes, the damage of both attacks will be added together for a total of 14, and then the Necrophidiuses' weakness to bludgeoning damage will be triggered once for a total of 19 damage. But, if he chooses to divide the attacks and strike each of the enemies once, the first will suffer 6 damage plus 5 more for the weakness, totaling 11 damage, and the second will suffer 8 damage plus 5 more for the weakness for a total of 13 damage. One of the concerns often raised about Flurry of Blows is it doesn't seem any different from just making two attacks since the multiple attack penalty still applies. But the true benefit of Flurry of Blows is that it only takes one action, which leaves one or two actions each turn that can be applied to other things like movement, and mobility is another area where monks really shine. Starting at third level, monks enjoy an increase to their speed score whenever they're not wearing armor. This starts as a plus 10 bonus to speed and increases by an additional 5 feet at 7th, 11th, 15th and 19th level for a final bonus of plus 30 feet. So a typical strategy for monks, especially at low levels, might be to spend their first action to move into melee distance, use Flurry of Blows to attack twice, and then their third action to move away. After third level, the monk likely has a higher speed score than most enemies 
meaning those enemies will have to spend two of their actions to move into melee against the monk, leaving them with only one action left to strike. And if the enemy has a ranged weapon, the monk can use their extra speed to move into cover that otherwise might be too far to reach with one action. Yes, if the enemy has reactive strike or other abilities that trigger on enemy movement, this would trigger it. But remember, unlike some other popular D20 based RPGs, in Pathfinder, not everyone has the ability to perform reactive strikes or what you might call opportunity attacks, but if you want to feel extra safe, you can take the Guarded Movement feat at 4th level that grants a plus 4 bonus to armor class against reactions that trigger on your movement like reactive strikes. So those are the abilities that are universal to all monks, but unlike some other classes, monks do not have a form of broad grouping of abilities to choose from, like how a cleric chooses their doctrine, a druid chooses their order, or a rogue chooses their racket. In other games, you might call these subclasses, but whatever you want to call them, monks do not have those. Instead, all monks have the previously mentioned features, and then each player can customize their monk by choosing feats. And a lot of these feat options are going to fall into one of three categories, which are stances, monastic weapons, and key spells. First, let's take a look at stances. Monks can learn several different combat stances, each of which have their own benefits, but they all work the same way. Unless otherwise stated, it costs one action to enter a stance, and once you are in that stance, it persists turn after turn until you are either knocked out, you violate any of its prerequisites, the encounter ends, or you use the dismiss action, which costs one action. You can also switch between stances by spending an action, but you can only enter a new stance once per round. Let's take a look at a couple stances available at first level. Dragon Stance and Mountain Stance. As long as a monk is not wearing armor, they may spend one action to enter Dragon Stance. While in the stance, they can choose to make unarmed attacks as normal, or they can make special Dragon Tail attacks that deal 1d10 damage and have the backswing trait. Meaning, when you miss with a Dragon Tail attack, you gain a plus 1 circumstance bonus made with your next Dragon Tail attack before the end of the turn. Also, while in the stance, you ignore the first square of difficult terrain. For comparison, let's also look at Mountain Stance. It also costs one action to enter the stance, and can only be used while not wearing armor and while touching the ground. While in this stance, the only strikes a monk can make are Falling Stone unarmed attacks, which have the forceful, non-lethal, and unarmed traits. The forceful trait means the more times you use the attack in the same round, the more damage it does, starting with the second attack gaining a damage bonus equal to the number of damage dice being rolled, and that bonus is doubled for the third attack and more. Note that you do not need to hit with these attacks to gain the benefits of the forceful trait, you only need to attack. Also, while in this stance, monks enjoy a plus 4 item bonus to armor class, and a plus 2 circumstance bonus against being repositioned, shoved, or tripped. And this armor class bonus does stack with the armor class bonus provided by Explorer's Clothing, Bands of Force, and the Mystic Armor spell. On the downside, while in this stance, the monk's speed score is reduced by 5, and they don't receive any dexterity bonus to their armor class, meaning if the monk's dexterity modifier is already 4 or higher, this stance will not increase their armor class. However, the dexterity cap can be increased by 1 with the Mountain Stronghold feat available at 6th level, and further increased to 2 with the Mountain Quake feat at 14th level. Let's illustrate how these stances work with an example. Seijin is fighting an enemy soldier, and this is the first round of combat, so he's not already in a stance. He uses his first action to enter Dragon Stance, and then uses Flurry of Blows with his second action. He makes a Dragon Tail attack as the first strike with no multiple attack penalty, and what he does with his second attack 
is going to depend on if that first attack hits or not. If that attack hits, he might want to make a normal unarmed attack with the second strike since it will be made at a negative 4 penalty, whereas another Dragon Tail strike would be made at a negative 5 penalty because it lacks the Agile trait. But if he misses with the first Dragon Tail attack, he definitely wants to make another Dragon Tail attack with the second strike of Flurry of Blows, since the plus one gain from the backswing trait would yield a final negative four penalty, just like with normal unarmed attacks. With regard to his third action, Sajin has some options, including making another attack at the maximum multiple attack penalty, moving away, making a recall knowledge check, and more. But one thing he absolutely cannot do with his third action is activate Mountain Stance in preparation of the soldier attacking him back. Stances are limited so that players may only enter a new stance once per round. So since Seijin used his first action on this round to enter Dragon Stance, he can't spend his third action to enter Mountain Stance and increase his AC. And it may also be worth noting that you may only enter a stance while in encounter mode. You couldn't, for example, enter the stance while in exploration mode in anticipation of an encounter. You would have to wait until after initiative is rolled and on your first turn in that combat encounter before you enter any stances. Those are the basics of how stances work, but there is one more stance worth mentioning here. Monastic Archer Stance allows a monk to use a bow with Flurry of Blows. As with the other stances we've looked at, it takes one action to enter a Monastic Archer Stance. And while in the stance, the only strikes a monk can make are with bows. They cannot make their usual unarmed melee attacks or swing their bow like a melee weapon. But they can fire their bow twice with Flurry of Blows, and use their bow for any monk ability or feat that normally calls for an unarmed attack unless it specifies a specific strike. This may only be done when attacking within half of the first range increment. So what this means is any ability that has the monk trait and includes the text make an unarmed strike can be delivered at range with a bow while in this stance. This includes things like one inch punch, Knockback Strike, Disrupt Key, and Shattering Strike, as well as key spells such as Inner Upheaval. And while we're on the topic of weapons, we should discuss the Monastic Weaponry Feat. This isn't a stance, but is an optional first level feat that expands the types of weapons a monk can use. By default, monks are only proficient with simple weapons and unarmed attacks. The Monastic Weaponry Feat grants trained proficiency with simple and martial monk weapons, and proficiency with these weapons increases whenever the monk's unarmed attack proficiency increases. In addition, any agile or finesse weapons you have access to from a familiarity feat also gain the monk trait, and you can use these weapons to deliver monk abilities just like with monastic archer stance. The only main difference being you don't have to be in a stance to benefit from the monastic weaponry feat. You could, for example, deliver a one inch punch with a fighting fan or perform a knockback strike with a bow staff. In addition to stances and monastic weaponry, the third optional path for monks is key spells. Key spells is a first level monk feat that allows the monk to harness their inner life force to produce magical effects in the form of focus spells. When you take this feat, you first need to decide if your key spells will be divine or occult, and you gain trained proficiency with those spell attacks and spell DCs. Wisdom is used as the ability modifier when calculating these. You also gain one focus point that can be spent and replenished as normal for focus points. And as part of this feat, you get to choose one first rank key spell, such as Inner Upheaval. This spell costs one action and one focus point to cast the spell, and lets you make one unarmed attack or flurry of blows, with a plus one status bonus to attack rolls, and an additional 1d6 to damage rolls that is of a damage type of your choosing between Force, Spirit, Vitality, and Void. 
And just like with all focus spells, key spells automatically heighten to half your level rounded up. This feat can be taken multiple times to gain access to multiple first rank key spells. At 6th level, monks can take the advanced key spells feat that grants access to 3rd rank key spells. Master key spells at 16th level grants access to 8th rank key spells. And Grandmaster key spells grants access to 9th rank key spells. In addition, several feats like Harmonize Self grant access to specific key spells. And others like Clinging Shadows Initiate grant key spells that provide new stances as well. And there are a few other feats of note, but as mentioned before, this video is for newer players, so we'll only be focusing on the lower levels. First, Flurry of Maneuvers, available at 4th level, allows you to substitute one or both of the Flurry of Blows attacks with grapples, repositions, shoves, or trips. But remember, all of these maneuvers have the attack trait, meaning they receive and apply the multiple attack penalty just like with normal strikes. So if you use the second strike of Flurry of Blows for one of these maneuvers, it will be rolled with a negative 5 penalty as normal. One staple of fantasy martial arts is swatting arrows out of the air. This is accomplished with the deflect projectile feat that allows a monk to spend their reaction to gain a plus 4 bonus to armor class against a physical ranged attack. Note that the trigger here is when you are the target of the attack, meaning this reaction must be declared before dice are rolled and success or failure is announced. Monks don't get reactive strikes like some other martial classes, but they can take the stand still feat to gain a similar reaction. It works in much the same way as reactive strike, except it doesn't trigger on manipulate actions or ranged attacks. And instead of disrupting manipulate attacks like casting a spell, stand still disrupts movement. Meaning if an enemy tries to use the stride action to run away, you can spend your reaction to make a melee strike, and if that strike is a critical hit, the stride is disrupted and the enemy remains standing adjacent to you. And another feat we'll mention is One Inch Punch, which allows you to gain additional damage dice at the cost of spending two or three actions for the strike. Two actions adds one die, and three actions adds two and this number of additional dice increases at 10th and 18th level. Those are the general basics for the mechanics at play with monks, but we should also discuss gear, especially since by default, monks avoid wearing armor and have limited access to weapons. One common question that comes up is how does a monk keep pace with other classes when they have no armor and no weapons to attach runes to? And the simple answer is that they do have ways to use runes, just like these other classes. The first piece of gear that most monks will want is a set of Explorer's Clothing. Explorer's Clothing is technically not armor, but can be etched with armor runes that don't specify an armor category. For example, a monk can etch a suit of Explorer's Clothing with a plus one armor potency rune, a resilient rune, and a size changing rune, making it plus one resilient size changing explorer's clothing, just like it was regular armor, but the monk wearing it is still considered to be unarmored, so they can use stances and other abilities that require you to be unarmored. But remember the one restriction that explorer's clothing is not considered to be any kind of armor. For example, it does not belong to the light armor group, and therefore you cannot place any runes on it that require a light armor, or medium or heavy armor for that matter. For example, you cannot place a shadow rune on Explorer's clothing. And the second piece of gear worth mentioning is Hand Wraps of Mighty Blows. These do for the monk's offense what Explorer's clothing does for defense. So as you might expect, Hand Wraps of Mighty Blows work basically the same way, allowing you to etch weapon fundamental and property runes to them to enhance your unarmed attacks. This allows a monk's attack and damage with unarmed attacks to progress along with other weapon wielding characters, but there are two points to keep in mind. First, 
these hand wraps modify all unarmed attacks, not just punches for fist attacks. They also modify kicks, bite attacks, tail swipes, and any other attack that has the unarmed trait. And yes, this does include a Leshy's cactus spines and their arranged sea pod attacks as well. For example, an orc with the tusks feet and wearing plus one striking holy hand wraps of mighty blows receives a plus one item bonus to attack rolls, an extra damage die, and an additional 1d4 spirit damage or 2d4 to unholy targets with all unarmed attacks, including, again, punches, kicks, and yes, their tusk attacks. And the second thing to keep in mind with runes and hand wraps is you can etch them with property runes that normally are restricted to certain damage types other than bludgeoning, but they only function when making unarmed attacks that deal that damage type. For example, Keen runes require the weapon they're attached to to deal piercing or slashing damage, but normal unarmed attacks deal bludgeoning damage. If this was a hammer, you wouldn't be able to place a keen rune on it, but hand wraps work differently. You can etch a keen rune on them or any similar rune, but they only provide their bonus when dealing that kind of damage. For example, when a monk enters tiger stance and deals slashing damage, with their unarmed attacks. So there you have it, a look at the foundational mechanics you'll want to know before playing a monk. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, and I would like to take a quick moment to thank everyone who supports me, whether that's by clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, subscribing to the Patreon, or buying a super thanks. I greatly appreciate everything you do to support me, and with that, thanks for watching, take care, and happy gaming.